get a load of this! If there was one game I had to name off the top of my head that had a substantial emotional impact on me, it would have to be Undertale. Now, I know what you're going to say. Oh, jeez. Undertale? But no, honestly, it was indeed one of the best character-driven games I've ever played. Even if fans took their fandom to unprecedented heights, for those unaware, Undertale was a landmark indie game that was developed by Toby Fox that became vastly beloved and its fans flooded the internet with fan art, videos galore, and the fandom became an entity of its very own. I don't think anyone could have predicted the success of Undertale and it may very well be the most successful indie endeavor in gaming of all time. So Toby Fox really had no choice but to start developing a follow-up to the gaming phenomenon he probably had no idea would even happen in the first place. So I experienced the game way after its release in 2019, and once again, I'm late to the dance again with playing its spiritual successor, and in many ways, more than just spiritual, Delta Room. This game is free to download and play, and it is only the first chapter in the story aptly titled Delta Room Chapter 1. This game supposedly has nothing to do with Undertale story-wise, but many of the characters reappear but everything takes place in an alternate universe. This may only be a demo of sorts, but man, they pack quite a bit of game into what is essentially a demo. Eventually, this game will be released as a complete package, and things with this chapter may be changed, but I like how things turned out here, and while it's different than Undertale, there certainly are similarities. The game starts off very ominous, asking you to create a name for your quote-unquote vessel, and you're asked several questions pertaining to your character's characteristics, but as you finish, you're told your choices do not matter, because it turns out this character already has a name, and unlike Undertale, your path is basically chosen no matter what happens. And we will get to that in a moment. Basically, the game just trolled you hard. We start off with Toriel dropping off her son Chris off at school. Right off the bat, we notice two familiar characters, Toriel and Alphys, who is Chris's teacher, who in Undertale played the royal scientist who worked for the king. So yes, they still have the same names and designs, but these are technically not the same characters from Undertale. So we are asked to go get some chalk, and the resident female bully, Susie, is tagging along, and she hates Chris's guts. They enter the storage closet, and soon enough, end up in a mysterious world known as the Dark World. And just like Undertale, we now find ourselves in a strange-looking landscape that immediately demands our curiosity. We are introduced to a mysterious prince wizard by the name of Ralsei, who informs us we are heroes, and they together are the chosen ones meant to defeat evil and seal a dark fountain. Of course, things can't be that simple, as what follows is one of the goofiest and charming stories you will probably play. Susie, being the bully, is just not feeling it and just wants to go home. Chris just goes with it. And we are introduced to Lancer, who is the son of the King of the Darkners, who are the species of monsters who inhabit the Dark World. He's a total goofball, and while he's helping his father guide the Legion of Monsters, he's not intimidating in the least bit. Susie, on the other hand, seems to be more violent and menacing than Lancer, and while Susie soon agrees to help Chris and Rousey in order to go home, she soon ends up getting tired of being a good guy and joins up with Lancer. The dialogue is absolutely glorious, and Lancer reminds me a lot of Papyrus from Undertale, who was always scheming to capture the main character Frisk, but Lancer is definitely lazier, and when it comes time for him and Susie to actually develop an evil plot, he actually ends up trying to trick you into helping you do it for them by having you design a machine to quote unquote trash your own ass. They'll actually build the machine you design 
for them from a series of choices and then proceed to blow it up claiming it sucks. There's tons and tons of Toby Fox's wit and humor in the dialogue and the characters definitely seem like those that would be very comfortable in the Undertale world. But there are definitely differences worth noting, like for example, we haven't even touched on the gameplay. First off, you can actually see the protagonist, unlike Undertale, which only had the enemies visible. While I didn't mind Undertale's choice of combat style, as a similar style worked so well for Earthbound, and it certainly worked for Undertale. I must say I prefer to see my characters on screen, it's just more entertaining to see more of the battle. Now, similar to Undertale, you can choose to fight or spare your enemies, but sadly our choices do not matter, which is kind of weird, and why we're even given the choices is curious. The lack of consequences for your actions is a bit disappointing, but after experiencing the story itself, I can't really say I am disappointed. However, it would have been nice to go back and have an alternate path to play, but then again, this is a demo. But this might very well be how the rest of Deltarune plays out as a total package, judging by the intro statement and how things play out in this chapter. In Undertale, your combat choices determine everything and ultimately how the story would progress and end, so it's difficult when playing Deltarune to not be taken aback by having access to these choices and there's not much that changes based on your preferred gameplay style. Though there will definitely be more entertaining dialogue if you choose the pacifist route even if it's not really a pacifist route in the way that Undertale portrayed it. You can choose to talk it out peacefully with your enemies to soften them up and then spare them or use Ralsei's powers to put them to sleep to quote unquote defeat them. When Susie joins up with you briefly at first you will need to actually warn your enemies so Susie doesn't end up attacking them. So when your enemies attack things are very similar to Undertale as you will enter into a bullet hell style minigame in which you will need to avoid the attacks by moving a heart symbol around a black box with the heart representing your very soul. Also there's this really weird mechanic where if your soul grazes, just grazes an attack you will gain TP, which stands for tension points, which is needed for special attacks. So it's basically magic points as it would be referred to in most RPGs. I found it very difficult to completely avoid attacks, so grazing them is easier than it sounds, and you will probably end up doing it accidentally more times than not, and I'm supposing that this was intentional. You will encounter obstacles and puzzles along your path, as you make your way toward the Dark Fountain, and little by little we see how Susie changes her tune and how her relationship with Lancer changes her as a character. Lancer basically is just a hyper child and he seems absolutely moved when Susie offers him to join your team. But in what at first seems like a double cross, Lancer ends up blocking you in the castle dungeon but you'll soon escape with the help of Susie. After Susie beats Lancer within an inch of his very life, Lancer reveals he locked them up to protect them from his father's wrath. Now from here, you can do a few more battles and face the king after making it to the top floor of the castle, but I would recommend taking a trip to the basement where you will eventually encounter my favorite part of the game. Suddenly, you will hear some rather unsettling carnival music and speak to a prisoner who informs you he is free and that you are actually in prison. The guy sounds totally out there, so you are told to go see the shopkeeper, Shom, who you visited earlier on, who is a total nightmare fuel worthy stitched up cat. I mean, dear lord, look at this guy, he's definitely the most unsettling creepy character in the game. And the creepy ass music inside the shop doesn't help either. So he happens to be the guy who locked up the prisoner and he will hand you the first key. And from here you will go on a little treasure hunt and have to find the remaining two keys to free the prisoner. And when you do, the prisoner is revealed to be a mad jester by the name of Jevil, who will put your combat skills to the test to say the least. 
if you go into this battle without a strategy, you will surely be a goner. This guy has some tough to dodge attacks. Did I say tough? Dear lord, some of these attacks are just fucking insane. And if you're not stocked up on healing items, you will simply get decimated. It also doesn't help that if you want to win this fight without fighting and ultimately use Pacify by Rousey to beat him, you're going to have to keep your TP at at least 50 to perform the technique known as Hypnosis, which takes up a whole turn. And this is something which is pretty weird because certain special attacks in the game have to be ordered by Chris. And please do yourself a favor and don't use the Pirouette attack just because it takes up less HP, because it's not as effective, thus requiring more turns. And it can also have some nasty side effects, even cutting the party's HP. This is a unique, fun, and memorable fight to say the least. Please do not skip this optional battle, because even though it's tough as hell, it's quite the experience. Plus, the music here is just fucking awesome. Oh my god, this track is just pure perfection. It fits the fight and the Jevil character so well. In fact, once again, just as he did for Undertale, Toby Fox has composed the music and there's quite a bit of amazing music for such a short experience. In fact, let me just go ahead and shut up right now so you could enjoy Jevil's music a bit better. After this battle, fighting the king is a joke, and after beating him, you will see Lancer take over the kingdom from his father, and Ralsei takes off his hat and reveals his face and he looks exactly like Azriel from Undertale. And then you will go home. Now you're at the end of the game, or at least chapter 1 actually, and will get the opportunity to walk around town and meet up with familiar faces from Undertale, even though they are not those characters per se, but they look like them and have their names. Undyne is a cop, Sans has just moved into the neighborhood, and wouldn't you know it, Asgore is your dad. Well, this alternate universe looks very less alternate and has quite a bit of familiarity, but I suppose there's no rules in an alternate universe, and I'm perfectly fine with having these relationships similar to those in Undertale. I actually really enjoy perusing the town and talking to all the characters. I don't know about you guys, but I am a real sucker for RPG towns. There's just something about towns and RPGs that really gives me this sense of immersion. When you get tired of chatting it up with the locals, you can return home and you will view the ending as you tear your own heart out of your chest in disturbing fashion. Well, that was sudden. So, this is quite the cliffhanger, and I'm very curious to see where this all goes and what the purpose of the Dark World was and how the story will be continued. It seemed like mostly everything was taken care of in the Dark World and the story was pretty enjoyable and well told for this glorified demo. I had more fun with that than a lot of full games actually, so we have to wait and see and Toby Fox says he plans on having a full team on board for the complete game. So how will that play a role in the overall presentation, story, and gameplay of Deltarune? We really are just going to have to wait and see. So guys, that just about does it for this review. I hope you all enjoyed it. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell to get all the notifications when I post all my new videos. I want to thank all my patrons for their continued support. And thank you all for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.